For this week's Source Fed Movie Club is watching Trading Places, so that's what we're doing for this Today We Review. Trading Places is a comedy from 1983. It's uh, rated R. It's directed by John Landis. John Landis has uh, made Blues Brothers, Animal House, and most recently in 2010 he made Burke and Hare. The summary for this film, a snobbish investor and a wily street con artist find their positions reversed as part of a bet by two callous millionaires. The snobbish investor is Dan Aykroyd. His character's name is Louis Winthrop III. They usually just call him Winthorpe. The wily street con artist is Eddie Murphy. His character's name is Billy Ray Valentine. And the two millionaires, the tricks of the movie, are uh, played by Ralph Bellamy and Don Amici. They're uh, Randolph and Mortimer Duke, respectively, the Duke brothers. Then there's Eddie Murphy. He's Billy Ray Valentine in this. He's the Wiley Street con artist. We see him panhandling in front of a building, and then he gets pushed away. After he's pushed away from panhandling outside of the building, Billy Ray has to go through the park, and he's kind of just pushing himself along on the ground because he's acting like he's crippled and blind. So a policeman removes his sunglasses, and then the two cops together lift him up, and then he suddenly is able to walk and gets his... Uh, a sight back from being blind and says it's a miracle and then the cops just let him leave because he started ranting and raving if it's that easy to get away from cops just start ranting and raving a bit I'm gonna start doing that more often he sees a cop car pull up when he's passing the Duke and Duke building and uh, waves at them and then turns and kinda like runs away bumps into Winthorpe you can tell that Valentine's just picking up the briefcase but Winthorpe is uh, extremely scared of any black people and so it's pretty racist but he just says stop thief so a chase ensues and Valentine uh, runs through Duke and Duke and Winthorpe ends up uh, helping to catch him Randolph and Mortimer Duke the Duke brothers from Duke and Duke are uh, commodity dealers and they are having a nature versus nurture debate to see if it's uh, all genetic or if you put uh, someone in a, the right situation that they will turn out right regardless of their upbringing so the Duke brothers put a wager on it that they will be able to show that it is actually nurture not nature because they're going to make it so Valentine becomes a businessman like Winthorpe and they're gonna make Winthorpe become a uh, downright criminal Coleman played by Denham Elliott is Winthorpe's uh, personal servant that is until the Dukes call him and tell them that Winthrop's going to be part of a scientific study, so then Coleman goes along with it and helps to destroy Winthorpe's life. So Valentine, he's just extremely uh, weary and kind of paranoid as to why the Dukes are doing this. I can't blame him though, I would be too, especially after they had just been the ones that put him in jail where he almost got beat up. Dukes are sincere in trying to give him what is needed to be successful because they want to settle their wager. Turning Valentine into a businessman, that was only half of the wager, so they do have to take down Winthrop. The way that they do it is by putting three marked 50s in his pocket. They're put in his pocket by Clarence Beeks, played by Paul Gleason in this. He's end up being paid $60,000 to get the agriculture reports to the Dukes. That way they can uh, make some wise market decisions. So the three fifties that have been marked have like huge red X's on them, which is a bit ridiculous. If they're going to mark something, you think they'd be a little more uh, stealthy about it. So Winthorpe is caught with them. He ends up having to go to jail. When he's released, uh, he's going out to see his fiance. But then Ophelia, who is Jamie Lee Curtis, is paid a hundred dollars by Beeks, and that is to kiss him right in front of his fiance. That is to make sure that Winthorpe has lost everything. He doesn't have his job. He's now lost his fiance because it looks like he's with a prostitute, which ends up happening. <laughs> like, they end up being together. But before that, Ophelia ends up taking him in because she checks his hands and finds that they're manicured and that he hasn't really ever done a hard day's work. At one point, we see Valentine and Winthrop uh, pass in cars, and Winthrop recognizes Valentine, Valentine recognizes Winthrop. And he ends up saying that mother, that uh, gentleman, was the one that got me arrested. I wish we had seen more of Valentine's transformation between uh, the con artist and this nice upstanding businessman because not once do we ever see him like, slip up in a business meeting say uh, motherfucker or anything like that and I think it was a little uh, too easy for him to just go from the rags to the riches and there should have been some at least uh, bleed over from being in rags. 
Winter ends up like crashing a party and uh, tries to get back at Valentine and whips out a piece of meat and then gets out a gun. But that's when Mortimer and Randolph, the Duke brothers, are able to say that their bet is over and that they did settle it. So they settle their big wager. It was for a single dollar bill. They've wrecked Winthrop's life and kind of made Valentine's over a dollar. Valentine had previously snuck out a joint that he took to the bathroom. So while he's in the bathroom smoking the joint, he hears the Duke brothers come in. And then they give a nice expositional piece to explain the whole bet to him. And that way Valentine knows why everything has happened and decides that he doesn't want to put up with that. And he goes and recruits Winthorp so they can get back at the Duke brothers for what they've done. By doing so, they want to get the agricultural report from Beeks. So that way the Dukes can't corner the market. They do it on a weird train scene. It seemed like a method just to get Jim Belushi in here. He seems to be in most of the John Landis films. He's in a monkey suit for this. So Billy Winthrop, Coleman, and Ophelia do get the swap of the briefcase and get the report out so they know what's up and then they are able to feed a fake report to the Dukes and uh, they also get Beeks money that he's being paid to do this and the Dukes kind of crash and burn and then Billy and Winthrop use the knowledge of the reports to make themselves a lot of money which is the exact same thing the Dukes wanted to do and then they also make Ophelia a load of money of what she has so really I don't think that they are very they're not exactly the most upstanding people if you look at it. They're exactly what the Duke brothers were going to do. So for Keeper Delete, this is going to be a delete. Um, it was an okay film. It wasn't a terrible film to watch once, but I'm not going to want to watch it again. Um, it's a tried and true story of the switching roles, but I honestly would prefer Freaky Friday with Jamie Lee Curtis and Lindsay Lohan for the uh, trading roles. I can see why some people find that it's perhaps a classic to them, uh, but it just wasn't for me. I did enjoy it though, but I'm not going to want to watch it again. Thanks for watching this Today We Review for Source Fed Movie Club. I'll put an annotation here for the other Source Fed Movie Club trading uh, responses. That way you can locate them. In the description it will bring it up by uh, upload date. If you do want to reach me, uh, you can do so on Twitter at MadLFan. You can use hashtag Today We Review. Thanks for watching. One of the greatest things that I liked in this movie, actually, you can see the tolerance between the eight, early 80s versus now in film. With Eddie Murphy, he says nigger multiple times at the beginning. And uh, Mortimer Duke, uh, Don Amici, says nigger in the film. It is a rated R film, and there were a lot of tits in the film, so PG-13 was going to have to be warranted. Um, but when they add the nigger and then there is a uh, faggot also. It does become, of course, rated R. I just think we need to stop like tiptoeing around these words. Words are only given the power that we attribute to them. If you feel uncomfortable hearing me say nigger, ask yourself why. What do you have to feel guilty for? You didn't do anything. You didn't warrant any guilt for the use of the word nigger or faggot. Just recently I was uh, with my friend's kids and the son doesn't know anything really about what's going to affect people. So he was just pointing with his middle finger and his mom kind of went a little off the deep end and said don't do that ever. The kid didn't know why but now he does know that this has bad implications. I think it's just time that we stop the pussification of the world. Nigger's a word. It just sounds put together.